All right, guys, it is now 10 o'clock. We will go ahead and get started. First of all, just want to say thank you so, so much for joining us this morning. Um, we are in unprecedented times, as everyone knows, and we're um, at Swage Lock trying to find new virtual training opportunities for our customers because it's a little more difficult to be on site right now. So we know that you guys have um, restrictions and limitations, so we're trying to provide every possible training opportunity that we can. So we're very, very pleased to have you here this morning. First, just a few housekeeping things. If you can make sure you're on mute, um, that helps kind of just with um, so many participants keeping the, the line clear. But we do definitely want to encourage questions throughout the webinar this morning. So if you do have a question or if one of our speakers prompts you for a question, please utilize the chat feature. If you hover over your screen at the bottom of the screen, you should, you should see a chat button. So please use that if you have any questions. We definitely um, we'll address those as we move forward. Also, this webinar will be recorded and I will share it with you at the end of the session today. So you can reference back if you'd like to or if you would like to send the information to other people at your organization, that is definitely encouraged as well. Also wanted to share that we will have another webinar two weeks from today on regulator performance and selection. So if that's something that you would also be interested in, I'm going to put a link to that information in the chat. So you can definitely follow that there. And if you're interested in that webinar, I will send you that information today. Now, um, without further ado, I'm really excited to talk a little bit about our presenters. So first, Doug Nordstrom, who is the Senior Product Manager for Hose, started his career with Swagelock as a manufacturing engineer in 1995. Um, in the years after that, he worked on various projects um, as a project manager in new product development. And then in 2006, he transitioned to marketing, where he was the Kim and Refining Market Manager for eight years. Um, then he moved into product management where he has spent time managing Swage Lock's regulators, valves, and hose product lines. And in this role, Doug is responsible for the strategic business development of Swage Lock's hose service group. He has a degree in mechanical engineering from Case Western Reserve University and an MBA from Kent State. So we're very excited to have Doug with us this morning. We also have a, a special guest speaker, Aaron Lindros, who is with the Post Technical Service Group at Swagelock. Aaron started with Swagelock in 1995 in high purity operations, and then after several years in high purity, he transitioned to Post Technical Service to help facilitate the integration of Swagelock's um, fluoropolymer line of hoses. And then in his hose technical service role, um, he's responsible for identifying solutions to customer issues, and he also develops and provides training on the technical aspects of Swage Lock hose offerings, along with supporting um, local Swage Lock sales and service centers like us. So we're very pleased to have Aaron here as well. So thank you both for leading our session today. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Doug. Thank you, Ashton. I hope everyone can hear me okay, and that was a wonderful introduction, and thank you everyone for joining. Um, like Ashton mentioned, we are going to be going through a short agenda today with some common things that we have learned um, throughout our time working in hose at Swagelock. Uh, we're going to start off with just a, a basic background on hose types and then talk about routing, because we see routing issues as the number one cause of uh, hose issues that we get that we get from uh, hose users of, of swage lock hoses and then uh, we're going to discuss three more advanced topics the first being static dissipation permeation in softer core hoses like like teflon ptfe core hoses and then the last one is metal hose so the actual core is metal and how it fatigues with dynamic motion so we're going to start with a background on hose types a hose is different than a tube, of course. I think we all know this because a tube is a solid single layer material, like a stainless steel tube, a PFA tube. Those things have one layer. A hose is different in that it has multiple layers. The core is what we usually refer to as the hose type. So when I say a PTFE hose, that means the core is made out of PTFE or Teflon. If I say a metal hose, that means the actual core is made out of metal. 
a lot of times 316 stainless steel. Um, and then that core needs to be supported because it's usually very, very thin. In the case of a metal hose, it's only about six to eight thousandths of an inch thick. So it does not withstand much pressure. Um, in order to withstand pressure, we have to reinforce it. And that reinforcement is a braid material. A lot of times that braid is stainless steel, uh, but it can be fiber in the case where uh, a hose should not have a conductive braid. Um, we can put fiber braid on the hose and it uh, maintains the pressure rating. Then we can put a cover on the hose for cleanability. That's optional, of course. And then as any hose uh, has an end connection that you can use to connect to whatever the system is, is being run with. So these are basically the four parts of any hose. Each one has strengths and weaknesses, of course, and the four main types um, that you'll see are listed here. The top one is the metal hose, which has a convoluted metal core. We'll get into that more later on how that's made, but the end connection is typically welded to the, to the metal core, so everything is, is um, secure. A fluoropolymer or PTFE core hose um, the end connection is typically squeezed on, and this is done either through a swage or a crimp. Uh, we offer a lot of uh, crimped hoses, but you can see both types in the field in, in use. Um, it's just a matter of how that end connection is squeezed to the, to the hose. A thermoplastic hose was really developed to withstand a lot of pressure spikes, um, pumps, hydraulics will cause uh, pressure spikes in a system and a thermoplastic hose is designed to withstand those types of pressure impulses where other hoses might fail after multiple impulses, a thermoplastic hose can, can absorb those pressure spikes and last much longer. Again, the, the end connection is typically squeezed on with a crimp. And lastly, a rubber hose is a down and dirty multi-use hose where an end connection is is usually pushed onto the hose. It's a, just a push to connect with a barbed end. And uh, the hose is made very quickly and it's, it's used in more general um, applications, air lines and water lines, things like that, that aren't, aren't quite as critical. Again, each hose has its own strengths and weaknesses. And what we see is that a lot of issues come about because the right hose is not being used for a particular application. So it could be a very high quality hose, but it's being used in the wrong situation and, and therefore failing sooner. We always say a hose is very similar to a tire on a car. So, uh, and, and a lot of hose users don't really understand that, but I think all of us, when we go out to buy a car, we don't think that we'll never do maintenance on a tire. We always, we always know we have to maintain the tires on a car. A hose is, is the tire of a fluid system. A hose needs to have a preventative maintenance plan. It, it will wear out no matter how good the hose is. It will not last forever. The right hose and the right application will last a very, very long time, but it, it will not last forever. A lot of times fittings, uh, some valves, tubing, will last forever because it's not, it's not put through the strain and stress and and um, torture essentially that a hose is put through. But the right hose and the right application will last a very long time. And a high quality hose in the wrong application will last a very short time. So it, uh, what we're trying to show in this graphic here is the strengths and weaknesses of different hose types. So for example, a, a metal core hose in a dynamic bend application will not last nearly as long as a PTFE Teflon core hose. Um, sometimes it's, it's needed because a metal core hose will not permeate, and sometimes that's important for a particular application. So a metal hose is needed uh, for a dynamic application because of permeation effects. And the user needs to understand that that means the hose won't last as long as a PTFE core hose. So um, again, we see most of the issues come around from hoses because the the wrong hose is being used in a particular application and just switching the hose type many times will make a hose last uh, tenfold longer. 
some examples that we've seen um, are listed here. Basically, this is a tire press application. What you see in the picture on the right is a tire press. There's a lot of vertical movement in a tire press, for those of you that aren't aware. This, this particular one moves about six feet up and down. And in order to supply steam to the tire press, a hose is used, of course, and it, the, the hose is insulated. That's what the black lines are. And we had a user of swage lock hoses that were had the hoses failing within three to four weeks. And that's really unacceptable. We know that hoses should last longer. And what we found is the hose was just the wrong hose for that application. It wasn't a bad hose. It just was not meant for high temperature steam in a, in a large dynamic application. So we uh, were able to work with this particular user on, on specifying a different hose. And it's a more expensive hose. And a lot of times that, that means um, there's some obviously uh, restriction on, on moving to that hose. But what we've learned is that this hose now lasts about 20 times as long. And obviously that's, that's a, in effect a cheaper hose for the application because even though the hose is more expensive, it's being replaced over, over a year, about two years now the hose lasts. And it's a very, very extreme application. So we were happy to be able to help in this situation. Another particular um, example is a customer just wasn't using a preventative maintenance program for their hoses. And so then when hoses fail, they, they a lot of times fail at a very predictable um, rate. And when we can predict these failures, they can be done proactively. So it's not done in the middle of a um, operation. And this wasn't being this wasn't being tracked, and we were able to help this user on tracking hose use and hoses being prevented, uh, you know, preventatively or proactively maintained was able to increase operations and you know decrease downtime cost essentially for this for this application. It's very important for any uh, hose to have a preventative maintenance program. Again, it is I can't say it enough. It is the tire on a car for a for a fluid system. And then lastly, it's important to understand that hoses are being handled. That's why it's a hose and not a tube. It's it's being moved around. Um, and a lot of times these hoses get very hot. They they get they can be very dangerous. A hose is a is a very high safety concern uh, for all of us. Um, and when people are handling hot hoses or hoses with dangerous fluids, it's important to always understand what can happen uh, from a safety perspective. And we see what we what we call steam tattoos. It's not always steam, but most commonly it's high high temperature steam. And metal metal braid obviously gets very hot and conducts heat to the skin very very quickly. And we see a tattoo. It's basically a mark, a burn mark, that happens because someone touches a hot hose and for this reason hoses are always offered with a lot of accessories that that increase the safety when handling hoses and this in this case um, insulation is put on a hose so that the outside of the hose is a more safe um, handleable temperature okay with that um, I guess I'd like to take a quick pause and see if there's any chat information on any safety concerns that people have seen with hoses. It's, it's a very common safety concern that we've seen, safety issue, but uh, a lot of times it's not really thought of. And so I'll, I'll pause here for a minute before I turn it over to Aaron to see if there's any questions. Okay, doesn't look like it. So I'm gonna hand this over to Aaron Lindros, who again is our technical service engineer, who's been with HOSE for quite a long time and, and uh, is quite an expert when we do these training classes. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Or Actually, it's uh, just late morning, but thank you for joining us today. And one of the first things that we had talked about was this, uh, you know, how HOSEs tend to be abused in many, many different applications. As you can see from these pictures, 
there are several things that would make anyone cringe when they see the, the hose in the application. Some of these were crimped during the cycling of the hose and others were actually run over while it was laying on the floor. And then you, this one on the far left was actually kinked because it was, it was hung up to dry, but it was hung parallel to the floor and the weight of the hose caused that hose to kink. So it's not always when the hose is in service that things such as this kinking happen. So we're gonna talk about proper routing of hose and how that affects the life of hose assemblies. When we talk about kinking, kinking is the top cause of failure for hose assemblies. When we put braid layers on the outside of the core tube, what that does is support that core tube to help keep it round. It also provides the pressure reinforcing capability for that hose assembly. However, any hose when it's overbent can get the core tube to a point where it loses its hoop strength, the ability to stay round, and it begins to flatten out on the, on the top and bottom, and the edges are damaged. Once that hose becomes kinked, the core tube being kinked may result in a hose that will never be able to attain its full burst pressure again. Kinking can be prevented in many cases by properly selecting a good length of hose or proper routing and use of elbows and special end connections to alleviate stress near the end connection. Swage lock also employs a minimum bend radius in talking about proper installation. We consider that to be twice the outside diameter of the hose assembly. We would like the hose to be straight for this length behind the end connection prior to being bent. So if you look in the catalog and see a bend radius, that minimum bend radius is going to be the absolute minimum that we can attain on that hose assembly However, we also don't want to start bending the hose until it's at least twice the outside diameter behind the end connection. There are several calculations that are possible in order to calculate the proper length for offset motions as well as these traveling loops. The thing to keep in mind with this that is most important is to identify what the range of motion is going to be throughout the entire cycling of the application. So if you understand what the hose looks like from its starting position to its full travel, that will help in determining which formula needs to be used in order to calculate this. And the sales and service center representatives can work with us and you to help determine what that proper length should be. If any of you have a, a long hose in application, I, I would imagine that there are some that, that do have uh, long hoses in here. If you could indicate what the average average hose assembly lengths are that you're typically dealing with, that would be excellent to have just as a, a gauge here. Most of what we do produce can be in the, the three to five foot range, but we also get some assemblies that are up around 50 feet, 70 feet. So we have some very long hose assemblies. The thing to keep in mind with those is that those can become very heavy. And if it's not properly supported, the weight of the hose alone can result in kinking, or at least, at the very least, strain right behind the end connection. So using elbows and adapters 
is an excellent way of relieving the strain on the hose assembly. Something else that is commonly seen, sometimes it's unavoidable, other times it is, but we would prefer that a hose be bent in one plane. So you should be able to bend that hose and then lay it down on the floor or place it against the wall. It should be in one plane, not bent in multiple planes. A hose that is in a static application and bent in multiple planes may be okay for a while, but if you put a, a hose that is bent in multiple planes and move it in a cycling application, that is going to severely shorten the life of the assembly. So that figure that we see on the left-hand side of the page is definitely much more acceptable than what we have on the right-hand side. The assembly on the left is going to last much longer. That installation with two different assemblies is going to last significantly longer than the one on the right-hand side. Okay, so any are there, questions? Are there yeah, go ahead. any questions on that? Yeah, so um, sometimes we hear from customers that, you know, when we go and do a hose advisory survey that they weren't aware that a hose was kinking because it wasn't 100% visibly apparent. And I think sometimes we think, you know, in order for a hose to be kinked, it has to be like a 90 degree kink. But is there some sort of um, easier, I guess, visibility test so that you really know a hose is kinked? Or is it just kind of following those steps that you just outlined? There's... There are some things that we discussed early on, that spreadsheet that, that Doug pulled up that talks about the various factors that hose cores may be better at one hose relative to another. We could see that a metal, metal hose handles temperature much better than it does impulse, for instance. In much the same way, a rubber core hose handles is more resistant to kinking than let's say a PTFE core hose. So you could take a, a PB series rubber hose and bend that and get it to flatten out and open it back up and it's probably hasn't had much effect on it. However, a T series hose, if you were to bend that hose, you could kink that hose and open it back up and it may appear that there is no damage to the core tube because the outside of that, the braid has actually gone back to its normal shape or it can go back to its normal shape. The more layers that a hose has, typically the better the hoop strength is going to be, but also the better that disguise of the damage that has happened to the core tube. So it, it is complicated to know what has actually happened. If, if you actually see that that hose has been kinked, it's probably a time to get that out of service, but it, because it is very difficult to know otherwise by taking a, a visual look. But if you can see that it's been kinked, if it's obvious from the outside, I would get it replaced. Yeah, and if I could add on to what Aaron said is, um, when a kink happens, it's because it was bent beyond its elastic limit. And for material science scientists out there, you would, you, you'll know that when it goes, when a material goes beyond its elastic limit, it is permanently damaged. It will not go back to its orig original strength. So when a hose is kinked, it will not maintain the same pressure rating it did when it was original. So it's a very important thing to to know if a hose has been kinked. And to Aaron's point, you can't always tell. So it's, it's a, it is a bit of a safety concern. Um, many people think, like your garden hose, when a hose is kinked, you can just kind of massage it back and it's, it's back looking normal and it's no longer kinked. And that's, that's not true. It has been stretched beyond its elastic limit. And even if it looks like it's original, 
it still has been kinked and it will not maintain the same pressure. And so it, it is a bit of a danger issue and there is no good answer for it because you can't always see on the outside if it's been kinked. So it, it is, it's important to make sure the hose is being installed correctly so it doesn't have the option of ever being kinked. Absolutely, thank you. It looks like we have two more questions. Um, first is, can you please explain the motion of hose calculation? And then the other is, any specific maximum angles that various hoses can be bent? Yeah, so this, this is just a summary uh, what I show on this, what, what Aaron and I are showing on the screen here, but different hose motions, we see a lot of issues come up because a dynamic situation does not allow for the right length of hose to be installed. And there's some industry standard calculations. These are not swage lock calculations. These are industry standards that we train our sales force and our engineers and, and our customers on how to determine the right hose length based on what kind of motion the hose goes through. And, and this isn't intending to train everyone on the call on how to do this, but there are a lot of in-depth calculations that our hose advisors um, at our different sales and service centers can do for you if you're, if you're interested. But when a hose is installed in a dynamic application like that tire press, uh, it might look okay but when the tire press goes through five or six feet of motion, the hose kinks, like Aaron was explaining, because the hose was not designed to be the right length for that amount of motion. And so it's always important to understand the amount of motion a hose will see and perform the right calculation. Um, if you have a particular need for that, we would be happy to uh, work with our hose advisors and, and have them get the right calculation done for you. That, that's what we're here for. You know, and I, I think to add to that, I think the simple answer on this, those calculations shown on the left-hand side are lateral offset motions, the, the top and bottom. Um, and then you have a traveling loop in the, in the center there that looks like a, a letter U. That's probably the most ideal situation is to have it in a letter U. If you can imagine putting an elbow on either end of that lateral offset that's on the left-hand side, you could very simply make a, a U shape out of that, and it would result in less strain on the hose. And then the other question I, is uh, maximum angles that different hoses can be bent, is that correct? Um, Yes, that is correct. So any specific maximum angles that various hoses, metal, thermoplastic, et cetera, can be bent. Okay, well the, um, that's an that's a in-depth question, it's a good question. Um, and it, it depends. In general, a metal hose will not withstand bending as much as softer core materials like a, like a Teflon. But there's exceptions and, and there's ways, and we'll get into that, there's ways to make metal hoses more susceptible or more uh, forgiving of bending. And so we'll get, we'll again, get into that. But that's why every hose catalog, not just swage locks, but every hose catalog should list a dynamic and static bend radius for each hose type. And of course, in a static application, you can bend the hose to that radius. And in a dynamic application, like you see on this screen, uh, it'll be a larger radius because the hose will be seeing more potential damage from the bending, from the constant bending. What we can, we do have tools that we can use to calculate the angles of a hose assembly. Let's say for instance, you wanted to know the minimum length the, of, of a hose assembly that you needed or that could be installed in the application, and you are looking for a half inch hose, but you just need to know what is the absolute shortest assembly that I can be provided that has swage lock compression end connections on there, and I need to bend 120 degrees. We can provide you that minimum length hose assembly, give you that, that number if that is what you're looking for. 
that type of information in addition to bend radius. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. All right, cool. So we're going to move on now, if that's okay, to uh, static dissipation. Like Aaron said, the number one issue we see is kinking hoses, either from improper routing or the wrong length being applied to a dynamic application. But the number number two issue we see is static dissipation uh, failures, let's say. And what static dissipation is, is the buildup of electrical molecules on the inner lining of a hose from the flow of media through the hose. Some media, a lot of hydrocarbons, for example, will deposit electrons on the inside lining of a hose, being Teflon, let's say. And those electrons build up over time and need to leave the hose. They, they, they go to the nearest conductive material. Many times the nearest conductive material is the metal braid on the outside of the Teflon core. And similar to when you shuffle your feet across a carpet in the winter and reach for a light switch, the static buildup from your feet jumps through your hand to the light switch and you get a spark. Same thing happens here. So as media flows through a hose, it builds up electrical charge and sparks through the Teflon core to the metal, metal braid. What this spark does is burns a small hole through the Teflon core and it makes a leak path, of course. So hoses start to leak because different sparks are shooting through the hose. And we see returns for this. We see product returns, product issues all the time. And it's a, it's a very common thing and it's a very easy thing to fix as well. What causes these static charges is a variety of different variables. One is what the media is. Different media have different likelihood of depositing electrons on a Teflon core hose. A lot of these are hydrocarbons and a lot of us are using hydrocarbons. Steam is also another one. So a lot of us use hoses with steam. So it's a lot of very common uh, media that we'll see in, uh, in the industries that we, that we deal with and it causes static discharge. The, uh, the key to know here also, similar to shuffling your feet across the floor, is the faster you shuffle your feet, or the faster the flow rate, faster the velocity, the more static charge will happen. And we see users of hoses, Teflon core hoses, that just turn the rotometer up or turn the flow rate up. And as a result, they start having this issue, or before they didn't have the issue. It's because the higher the flow rate, the more friction, the more the more uh, electrons are being deposited on the inner core of the Teflon. And again, Teflon has basically infinite resistance. So the, the static charge is not flowing anywhere. It's, it's staying right there and it will jump through the core. That's why it jumps through to the metal braid. Uh, different, uh, you know, similar to in the winter, you're gonna have an electric charge more than in the summer because humidity is different, temperature is different. So all these variables come into play with static dissipation of a hose as well. This particular example, what we're showing here is on the left, a uh, user of a, bunch of a bunch of hoses that we had, and all the yellow marks are pinhole leaks caused by static discharge that the hose had because this particular user went and turned up the flow rate. All of a sudden the hose sprung leaks all over the place because the inner core was not carbon infused. And so any Teflon core hose has the option of being carbon infused. And what this carbon does is it's made into the Teflon. It's not a, it's not a coating on the Teflon, it's, it's embedded in the Teflon. So it does not come off. It, it's impossible for it to come out um, or leach out of the Teflon, it's, it's embedded in. And, but what it does is it gives the Teflon the ability to have a very small electrical flow rate. It gives it less than infinite resistance. And so there is some electron flow that's enough to dissipate the static charge. That's why we call this a static dissipative hose when it's, when it's infused or 
or um, embedded with a carbon. And that's what you see on the right is a black carbon core. The Teflon becomes black because of the carbon and it allows for a, a small amount of electric flow so that the electrons don't jump through to the braid. They actually flow through to the braid or flow through the end connection, whatever the, the nearest ground is. These two examples, um, and it's a bit technical, I understand, but it shows the difference between a conductive hose, which is what you see on the right. This hose is a metal core, has a metal braid, has metal end connections. The entire hose is conductive. It will flow a very high amount of electrons, 22.5 amps of current is flowing through this hose. And the hose on the left is a Teflon core hose with a, with a non-metal braid. And what it is flowing through is 0 0.006 milliamps of current. This is nearly 4 million times less. So we consider this hose on the left to be non-conductive. There are situations where a hose should be non-conductive. It, it, the hose should not um, allow ground from one connection to the other connection electrically. It needs to be electrically isolated. This hose on the left, although it will dissipate static, it does have some current flow. It is not considered conductive. It has a very, very high resistance still to conductive flow. So there's, there's differences here. You can have a completely non-static dissipative hose. In other words, a hose like you see on the left, but it's not a, a carbon infused core. You can have a static dissipative hose that is non-conductive, which is what you see on the left, and you can have a fully conductive and static dissipative hose, which is what you see on the right. So it's important to understand what type of hose you're getting if you have electrical concerns. Hey, John, they, looks like we have a yeah. question here. Um, doesn't the carbon black contaminate if a pure media is used, even yeah. if carbon is embedded, won't it react with media? So we've had this tested. We, um, the reason we've had it tested, and Aaron, please jump in when I'm, when I'm done, is we have a pharmaceutical um, biofarm type hose that we offer with the carbon black core. Um, in, in the case where static dissipation could be a concern. And we've had it tested very thoroughly for FDA compliance and those, those types of things. And it does not leach out any carbon. There's no reaction. And it is fully FDA compliant. Aaron, I don't know. You might and know a bit more about I, that. Than I think they ran a after 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 subtle uh, ramps up and down, they did a total organic carbon test on the fluid that they ran through the hose and found that there were no, there was no organic carbon particles within that that media, and the testing that we did submit to the FDA it was found to comply with their regulations that they require for cleanliness. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. I so, think the, the perception is, is that, be, you know, people look at this and they say, oh, it's black, it must be dirty. That's not the case. It's carbon that is, it's embedded in the, the PTFE core. It's just there to create a circuit out of something that's normally an insulator although it's such a, a very minute amount of circuitry that's created, it's still just enough to allow that static to dissipate. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. I was going to say the same thing, and I see, I see the follow-up question. Static dissipative hoses have the same exact bend radius and same exact uh, dynamic life as a, as a pure uh, Teflon hose, so it does not impact dynamic life at all. It's a very easy and a very low price. It's a, it's a very low price adder and it solves this problem completely. So we, we see this as a, as a large issue that is very easy to solve. And so we, we try to tell people, when in doubt, buy a carbon core hose. It, it really has no downside to it. So, 
to, to kind of summarize that, those are very good questions. Um, understand the, the key here is understand the media's likeliness of causing this problem. And if there's any question, use a carbon core hose if you're using a PTFE core. Of course, a metal core hose is going to be very conductive and you don't have this problem. But it, with, a, with a Teflon core, always lean towards the carbon core. It, it solves many, many issues. Um, but we can also help with understanding your media. So if you're, if you're wondering if your media will cause this issue in, at what velocities, we have a lot of history with this. We have a, we have a, a bit of a database built up on what uh, we see with hose users and what, when these issues can arise. Um, the other thing to understand is just because the hose dissipates static, it does not make it conductive. It will not act as a grounding wire. Uh, if you want a hose to be conductive or if you want the hose to be not conductive, this is a completely different conversation than static dissipation. Static dissipation is a trickle of a flow of current. It's, it's like a drip of a faucet compared to a river, right, of, of, of flow, if you use that analogy. So they're two different, two different situations. Um, I see a question comes up. Do, do you ever see static discharge problems in gas flow? Um, very, very good question. And yes, we actually see static discharge more often with gases. Um, steam and a lot of hydrocarbons with gas, a lot of gas hydrocarbons, methane, ethane type gases are more common as far as what the issue is. A lot of times li liquids can cause this, but uh, it's less common with liquid media than it is with gas media. Good question. Okay, I'm gonna hand this off to Aaron to, to review some permeation uh, things that we've seen with different hose types. Yeah, so permeation, typically when we think of permeation, helium and hydrogen are the two gas molecules that come to, get, come to mind most readily just because they are so tiny. These are the smallest molecules that we try to contain when we're transferring gases. So we are especially mindful of product selection when dealing with this. We have metal core hoses that we typically use in pressure containing applications when dealing with molecules that are so small. When we deal with permeation, the concern that we have in here is something where we first deal with safety. We may have permeation of a gas that could cause a hazard to others if it is something that is in a confined space or it gets built up in a, in a concentration above a certain limit. And that the other thing is that it can lead to significant product loss. So we don't want a hose in an application that is going to cause too much product loss to be costly to the user. So there's a couple things that we do to, to help identify uh, permeation and things that we can help to do to alleviate this. SwageLock is working now to better understand permeation and the effects that these different factors have on permeation. So the larger that a hose is, the greater the surface area within that hose, and obviously the greater the permeation rate is going to be. When you increase pressure, the rate of permeation is also going to increase. That's a, a linear effect on the permeation rate. Temperature, when molecules are heated up, they move faster and therefore would permeate faster. Wall thickness, specifically with uh, core tube materials, as wall thickness gets thicker, that is going to slow down the initial permeation of gas molecules going through that core. Probably the number one factor that we have found in reducing permeation, specifically with PTFE core products, 
is sintering. We use sintering to tighten the bonds between PTFE and slow down the permeation rate of gases through our hose products. So, so for example, this is on the right hand side, this is our test rig that we've set up in Solar at our hose lab. This allows us to test various hoses and compare one to the next. So for so for example, we have put non-centered PTFE hose products in here and found out that nitrogen gas at 3,000 PSI. Hey, Aaron, hold on just one second. It sounds like, is anybody else experiencing the feedback? Can you use the chat feature and let us know? I'm hearing yeah. some static on the line. I, I, was, I was getting it also just when you started this slide. Okay. Okay. I'm going to plug my headset and plug back in. Yeah, so it seems like we're having a little static, Aaron. Okay, is that better? Yep. Yes, thank you. Okay. All right, so if we do have a, a quarter inch non centered product, we find that that permeates at a rate that is significantly faster than anything we have that is centered. There are two centered methods that we apply. One is slow sintering, where we center the product or heat it up as it passes through the process. By slow sintering it, it's almost as though it's going through a pizza oven, where it goes from one end and continues to run through the other. And when it comes out the other end, it is finished with that process and the PTFE is tightened up. Post sintering, on the other hand, is more like an oven where you'd put a cake into it or cookies, something of that nature, where you take the extruded PTFE core, take the entire coil of that product, put it into the oven and bake it and allow the hydrocarbons that are applied to the PTFE during the extrusion process to get totally baked out of the PTFE. When those are baked out, the molecules of PTFE are bonded together and that slows down the permeation rate considerably. So centering and post-centering are the two methods that we use to slow down permeation most significantly with our hose products. Here's a graphical representation to show a non-centered versus slow-centered versus post-centered PTFE core tube from a quarter inch hose. And this is, this is a one foot section of PTFE hose. The downside to centering is it slows our, our ability to manufacture hose down. Our processing time is reduced, so we have to plan ahead. So in summary, post-centering a PTFE core tube is going to maximize performance with regards to permeation. Slow centering will improve permeation performance, but it doesn't do as good a job as post-centering. So it's important to understand whether you need permeation resistance in your hose, and if you do, come to us to help identify which of our products have the best permeation resistance. And we are currently working on this. As I said, we do have our lab set up now with the permeation test rig. We are testing our hose products so that we can, can compare one hose to another and identify the permeation rates of each. Are there any questions on permeation? Okay, I see there is one here with, does centering affect performance of the particular hose? So it does not affect the, the performance beyond the rate of permeation. So it will improve 
its permeation resistance, but as far as its pressure containment, temperature rating, bend radius, those attributes, those are all things that are more impacted by the braid wire and reinforcement layers that are put on the outside of the hose. If I, if I could add to that too, Aaron, um, when we offer a hose series, this is this is now swage lock. I, I can't speak for the for other hose suppliers, but when we offer a hose series, it's always centered the same way. So we have some hoses that are post-centered, uh, the T series, for example, and we have hoses that are slow centered, that uh, like the X series, for example, and they're always made in that fashion. And um, so it's not a series, it's not a within a series variation. Okay, so our last topic today is, is to understand metal hose. So these last two topics with static dissipation and permeation are, are focused more on PTFEs and softer materials. Uh, this is obviously looking now at how a metal hose is made and there's various various ways a metal hose is made. But all of them start with this type of process where a metal hose is started with a uh, thin strip of metal, 316 stainless steel most commonly, but um, this is then rolled into a tube and seam welded. So the picture in the middle has a seam weld down the length of the tube. A lot of times this tube is very thin, six thousandths, eight thousandths, ten thousandths, depending on the hose size. And the hose is then corrugated, and these corrugations is what makes the metal hose flexible. If you can imagine trying to bend the thin tube in the middle, it would kink instantly, right? So the corrugations allow the hose to bend. That's why they're important. And the key is to understand how these corrugations are made. How the corrugations are made is a key in how long, understanding how long the hose is going to last in a dynamic application. If you can imagine a paper clip, even the most flexible metal paper, cl paper clip is going to break as you bend it back and forth multiple times. The same thing happens with the metal hose. Uh, the, the better the hose is made or you know, the different ways a hose is made can determine if it lasts a long time, you know, if it, the paper clip is going to last a long time or if it's going to last a short time. The most common way a metal hose is formed is with what we call a mechanical forming method which is rollers on the outside or inside, but most of the time the outside of a hose that bend into the hose and form the corrugations. And uh, this is a very fast way to make the hose. It's a, it's a low cost way, but you can see in the picture on the left, the seam weld starts in the left side of the hose and then it wraps around. It, it's basically twisted around the hose. And like Aaron mentioned at the beginning, with two uh, plane bending. The reason two plane bending of a dynamic hose is, is the death of a hose is because it twists the hose when it bends. If you can imagine bending a hose in two planes, it's twisting. And that twisting action is what kills the hose. A mechanically formed hose with, with rollers is basically twisting the hose before it's even applied to an application. So the hose already is, is starting uh, behind the eight ball if you will, it's already losing life because it's, it's twisted. And what happens as the hose goes through multiple bends is the root of these corrugations cracks, similar to a paper clip. And that's what you see on the right side. The, the actual roots break and you get a leaking hose. The alternative way to form a metal hose is, is hydroforming or also uh, crimp forming. They're, they're similar processes, basically the same thing. And what is done is the inside of the hose is pressured with very high uh, pressure, uh, such as 5,000 PSI of water. And this water forms the hose into a dye. And the dye is in the shape of the corrugations. Um, the advantage of this is that it pressurizes everywhere the same. There's no, there's no work hardened um, spots that you get with mechanical form. 
and there's very little thinning of material and there's absolutely no twisting. So there's no twisting of this, of this core tube of a hydroformed hose, but it takes longer to do it. So it, it, it's a little bit more expensive, similar to the sintering that Aaron explained. Um, this is a more costly way to make the hose, but it will last far longer in a dynamic application. Actually, we, what we see with the hydroformed hose is the roots aren't what fails. It is actually the crest of the convolutions that wear away because the metal braid rubs against the hose in a dynamic application to the point where it rubs away the crest material and fails about 10 times longer. So if you get, for example, 10,000 cycles out of a mechanical formed hose, what our experience is, the hydroformed hose will last about 100,000 cycles and it will be a different failure mode. But the important factor here is to understand what application a hose is going into, a metal core hose, and whether or not it's gonna see a lot of dynamic motion. If it is, uh, make sure you talk to your hose supplier and understand how that metal core hose is being made. Is it a hydroformed or crimp formed hose? Or is it a uh, mechanically formed hose? And if it's mechanically formed, make sure that you understand that you have to change your preventative maintenance program to reflect that amount of hose life versus a hydroformed hose. Um, and with that, I'd like to see if there's any questions on uh, anyone with applications for metal hose. Again, a lot of times metal hose is being used because it eliminates all permeation and it's good for high temperatures, but um, in the case of dynamic applications, it, it um, doesn't last quite as long. So are there any questions now on, on metal forming? No, okay, well, I, I guess I'll ask if there are any questions at all on anything we've presented. I guess the key here is to understand what hose type is best for your application. What we see most commonly is the wrong hose in, the, in a particular application and the right hose will fix everything. Um, plan for the right routing, especially in dynamic applications, and then understand static dis dissipation. And lastly, understand if you're using a PTFE hose, how's the hose made? How is it centered? Is it used in a gas application that, that permeation is going to be key? Or if you're using a metal hose, how's that hose being made? Always understand how the hose is made so you, you make sure that you're using the right hose in the right application and you'll see drastic improvements in hose life and hose safety. With that, I think we'll, we'll see if there's any questions on anything that we presented today or anything else. There's something here about <clears throat> um, cleaning the hoses. Can we get um, hoses cleaned for oxygen service? And, and yes, we do have hoses that we can clean for, for anything, whether it be oxygen or pure gases, we can clean them to a higher level. We don't refer to them as being SE11, which is an internal cleaning spec at Swage Lock, but we can clean them to ASTM G93 level C or any other spec that you decide to provide to us. So that is something that we can do. If you provide us with the application details, we can help you to, to make sure that the hose that's provided is aligned with that application. Yeah, good question. I, I see the next question about metal hoses. Are they all hydroformed? Um, the answer is no. V very few hoses are hydroformed because of the expense. Um, Swage Lock, though, we have, I believe, five different metal hose series lines, and they're all hydroformed except the FM. Our FM hose is intended to be uh, keep the price more in line and it's a high pressure hose and it is mechanically formed. The other swage lock hoses, FJ, FL, FX, 
and our Hasseloid AHOs are all hydroformed or crimp formed. I see the question also, can we provide hoses above 300 or 430 bar? This is the maximum available is FX. Our maximum, um, yeah, metal hose is FX. Um, we are looking into higher pressure hoses and we're looking to go up to 700 bar or even higher. Um, it is a development effort, of course, because with any flexible hose, it's, it's very difficult to make a product flexible and high pressure, as I'm sure you can imagine. So we are working on that. Uh, it, it's a, it is a technology development for us, uh, but we're looking to go to 700 or higher bar. Eight, eight, 875 is actually one of the, one of the targets out there. Um, but it is a challenge and it won't, it won't be very soon that it's, that it's gonna be released, but we are looking into that. So 875 is, is the bar as of today. That's, that's the 875, it's, that's the target. Seems to change daily. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a moving target. That's right. The, um, so they, there is a question about the ASTM G93, if that is possible for enriched oxygen applications, and that is possible. Yes, we would, we would do that for uh, typically a PTFE core hose product, and if it gets above a, a certain pressure, we would suggest the Monell end connections or even brass end connections for that. I see the question also Covers on low, low temperature cover. Yeah, that, that's a great question. And in our latest catalog, um, if you go to swagelock.com or, or um, find the, the hose catalog, we, we have recently released a low temperature insulation material and it is intended to do exactly what you're describing, Sujit, where we are trying to keep any condensation from forming on the outside of a chiller line. And so the insulation material is designed uh, for that low temperature. And we put a poly, a permeation proof poly shrink wrap cover and a sealable boot on the end connection to eliminate any moisture from getting inside that might ruin the insulation material. Um, and it's, it's been a very popular accessory for us. So it's again, intended to you know, stop condensation on the outside of cold lines. We also have a, a hot insulation. It's not in the catalog yet, but, but we do offer it um, for heated steam lines. And it's a different cover material that allows actually permeation out. So if any steam were to permeate through the hose, it, it, it will also permeate through the insulation material. What we're trying to do is keep the insulation dry. Um, I see uh, the question about uh, low pressure CNG hose for supply to the engine. Um, we, that might be we have done, yeah, we have done some metal hoses for that. We've done, um, relatively low pressure CNG hose, but they've been all metal hoses. Um, you know, the concern with that is because of the vibration encountered in engine applications. They want something that's going to handle that vibration. And again, hose is a matter of good, better, best. And they looked at this and said, we want something that's able to handle a, a fire if in case it did ever occur where there was fire in that location. So they chose to go with an all metal hose product. And then they scheduled a more frequent replacement or maintenance cycle on that hose. But that's what has been done for CNG supply lines. And the follow-up question there with maximum uh, vacuum pressure, metal hoses do an excellent job of uh, vacuum. It, you can imagine a metal hose with the convolutions. It has a lot of hoop strength, far more than a Teflon core, far, far more. And so it basically can, uh, we, we do have 
vacuum ratings on our metal hose, but it's millitor of absolute pressure. It, it's it's 99.99999% vacuums. Uh, we, we can supply those to you. We, we'd be happy to. And each one's a little different. So I don't know them off the top of my head, but they're, yeah, I mean, it's, they're extreme vacuum uh, pressures for metal. Pretty hose. much whatever you can throw at it. Yeah, it, it's it's. <laughs> You, you won't have a vacuum failure with, with metal hose. There's so much hoop strength. Let's see. Common applications for that one. I'm not sure that some common applications where swage lock metal hoses are used in more volume. Yeah, Would so that be specific to vacuum? I'm not sure, but, but but basically metal hoses are used when two things um, are a concern in general. This is a general comment. Um, one is permeation. Metal hoses will essentially stop all permeation. Um, and the other one is temperature. Metal hoses can be rated up to 1000 degrees Fahrenheit. So, so when those two uh, concerns arise, we generally recommend a metal hose. Um, they're more expensive than softer core materials, so, so it's not usually the top pick, but when permeation and temperature are bigger concerns, that's when we go to metal. Um, these can be steam lines, for example, is a, is a popular application. A lot, of, um, a lot of hotter applications like that, um, dangerous gases, toxic, toxic gases. So it kind of depends on, on the situation. And as far as covers go, I, yes, we can, we can, yeah. Do you want to answer that, Aaron? Yeah, as I was going to say, there, there are some, several options out there. The most common options that we have are spiral guard. It's a high density polyethylene plastic spiral wrap that we can put on the hose. It also provides abrasion resistance. Something that's a simpler option if you just need a connection to be identified near the end connection is to wrap a polyamide tag. We have, have tags that we can wrap around near the end connection and put information on there about the hose or the date of manufacture right near the end connection of that hose. And if it's just a matter of having it there to identify which connection that lines up to, we can do something as simple as a colored tag on there as well. Awesome. Uh, looks like we have a follow-up question. Uh, can we offer thermal sleeve or fire jackets with different colors? Thermal Thermal sleeve, we have not done any different colors of that. It's typically, that one is, is limited to a, the color that it is, kind of that tannish color. And I believe that there is one that's a little bit lighter variation of that, but it really doesn't differentiate the, the hose significantly. Fire jacket, we have done different color offerings on that. I believe we've had blue, red, orange, and white that we've done on, on fire jackets. So it is possible to get different colors, but the lead times are, are quite long because we don't do those as uh, standards. You know, so our fire jacket is typically there for insurance to protect the hose more or less. And then RFID tags. So RFID tags could be something that we develop in the future that the, and it could even be something where if your customer has a specific tag that we would like put on the hose, we could end up doing that for you. And then they, they could program that hose on site. The one thing that we have seen in investigating this so far is that there are several different writers out there. So you may have a, a reader and a writer that work well 
for one customer, but a separate customer may have a different writer that they use. So I think that easy part is the actual tag itself. The more difficult part is actually writing the information in a format that they will be able to read it. So it might be a matter of just supplying a, a tag on there for them so they could read it, or I'm sorry, so that they could download the information they want on that tag when it arrives in-house. Well, great question, guys. Thank you so much for um, reaching out and using that chat feature. If you have any more questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us, either to your key account manager or reach out to me um, personally, Ashton Leg. once I send you the recording this afternoon, and we'll make sure we get you in touch with somebody who can answer your more um, application-specific questions. But I know um, we have gone over a bit today, but I really appreciate the back and forth and with that, I'll go ahead and conclude today's session. So thank you all again very much, and, and great job, Doug and Aaron. We really appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Cool. Thanks. Thank you.